Were you always a top order batsman, even from a young age? Yeah, always. Um, when I was young, Dad said to me, no one wants to open the batting, so there's two spots there. I got picked in. I actually got picked in the second 11 side for the seniors before I got picked in a junior side for um, WA. It's a hard, bouncy wicket that the whacker is. It can be difficult, but, you know, it does help having grown up on wickets like that. Do you think your mindset as an opener differs from those lower down? As an opener, you just got to accept that sometimes, you know, you're facing a new ball normally on the, on the the when the wicket's fresh and when the bowlers are fresh, that sometimes you're going to get knocked over and that's just part and parcel of it. I think the main thing is you see when guys make big runs, it's people that are hungry and want to want to make really big runs. They're not satisfied with 100. They want to make, you know, 150 or 200. It's just a flurry of emotions because that, that is literally your dreams coming true and then, then it's actually a reality. So that's one of the things I've like explained to people is it's easy to dream of stuff but when you actually have to do it, it's like, oh, shit, like, I'm actually going to have to, you know, go and play for Australia or whatever. The, the baggy green. Michael Hussey gave me my hat. The best innings that day, well, was Richard, but um, Pajara to be able to just cop an absolute barrage from everyone and just wore them and um, sort of felt like he batted a bit like an Australian. Currently playing county cricket in the UK for Leicester. I just thought when the opportunity came up to come and play county cricket, especially up when I finished the Ashes last time, I thought, you know, I've got to come over and play county cricket if I get the chance. <laughs>
And then when you made your de that debut season, 2010-11, was it a third first-class match? You got 157 the, uh, at the age of 18, the youngest Australian mm -hmm. at the time to score 150. How did that make you feel? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was my third yeah, third game of Shield Cricket. Um, we'd sort of gone through... I'd been lucky enough to get a rookie contract that year. That's when I was 18. And then... Um, WA had sort of been going through a bit of a, um, I don't know, they sort of had a tough start to the season, so they gave an opportunity to a few of us younger guys. And luckily enough, I was one of those people. I'd done quite well in club cricket and in second level cricket that season, so I'd got my opportunity. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, luckily enough, I think it was when you're young, you don't really think about too much. It was just one of those couple of days where I just batted and batted and batted and ended up being on 150. I wasn't really too sure how I did it, but. Um, it was a good a good thing to get, you know, in such an early stage of my career and a great achievement. How do you find the adaptation to pro cricket? Was it always an ambition of yours to become a professional? And when the reality came, how did you how did you find it from a mental perspective? Yeah, it was always a dream um, to do, but it sort of happened. It happened really quickly for me in the in the fact that. Like I said before, I'd never been in many of the junior squads and stuff for WA coming up young. And then um, I had a breakout year when I was like 16. I just got, I got a bit strong. Like you do when you're a kid, you get a bit stronger and you grow a bit. And all of a sudden I could start playing a few more shots. Um, and I always had a steady technique. So um, it just, it happened within probably 18 months. It all sort of went from just playing club cricket to all of a sudden I was, you know, opening the batting for WA. But it was always a dream. But like anything, when you're young, things take a little little while to work out. So I was in and out a fair bit of the stateside. But, you know, to you're just so pumped to have, you know, fulfilled one of your life's dreams to be playing professional cricket that you just, you love every minute of it. it was a standout moment early in your career, that 2014-15 Shield final. So 81 in the first innings and 158 in the second, standing up in a big game. Yeah, I, rec I reckon it was probably, it was almost the turning point. I'd been, um, you know, that was probably my fifth season with WA then. It always been a bit the same for me. I was sort of in and out, um, struggled to play a full season without being dropped or whatever. So um, to be able to do that in a Shield finals, actually, the I'd had a, that season, I'd batted really well without getting any big scores. So I knew it wasn't too far away and then, um, in the week leading up to that, my um, nana had passed away. So I didn't join the team till late down in Tasmania, which is, you know, it's two flights from Perth. Um, so I just think I went into the week with, I wasn't really too worried about cricket um, and just went out there and played. And yeah, I got, you know, batted well in the first innings and then in the second innings happened to get a hundred. And, um, you know, I still, I don't think it was the defining moment. But I think it was one of those moments when I was like, well, you know, I think I can actually, you know, perform in big games like Shield Finals in Australia, are, you know, the next biggest thing besides Test Cricket. So to get 100 in a Shield Final was pretty special. And if we talk about, say, the technical aspect of the game and any tips you can give youngsters, when you're out in the middle, how much do you adapt your game in terms of the, from the person that you're facing? Like, do you adapt your stance? Do you take different... Um, uh, guards dependent on the bowler you're facing. Any tips and advice you can give youngsters watching this? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, for example, if someone's bowling over the wicket to me and trying to swing the ball back in, I'll probably open my stance a little bit just so um, I can access the leg side because that's obviously they're trying to bowl straight um, and I don't want to fall over. So I try to keep my head going down, probably like back towards the stumps and probably mid on ish. Um, and try and get my alignment right um, and just try to, you know, take out the mode of dismissal that they're trying to get me out with. Um, then as a left-hander, the in vogue thing at the moment is everyone just bowls around the wicket. So um, to try, maybe try and square off my stance a bit more, not be so open and just sort of, they're going to try and, you know, nibble a little bit each way from on an outside off stump. So try and combat that. Um, you know, I had a good challenge with that with Stuart Broad in the Ashes, which was difficult, but um, I've put a lot of work into working on that in the last probably 18 months, and I sort of feel like it's helped a bit. But, yeah, I, 
whoever's bowling, I yeah, always change my stance on my guard or whatever, just trying to combat what they're trying to do. And then 2015, 16, at the end of that season, you made the move from Western Australia to, to play for Victoria. How did that move come about? What were the reasons behind it? Well, it was a bit, a bit, it was a bit like what I was talking about before, where I just felt like in WA, I was sort of two steps forward, three steps back. Um, and just got to the point where I needed to, you know, get out. Perth's not a very big place. I just need to get out of my own space a little bit and just go and do my own thing. Um, and I had a personal coach um, that had encouraged me just to, you know, if that opportunity arose to go play somewhere else, you think it'd be good for my career. Um, there was no, you know, there was no issues or anything with anyone in WA. It was just that for me as a cricketer, like I sort of felt like, it felt like if I got to the age of, you know, 26 or 27, I could have got the tap on the shoulder and said, thanks for coming. You know, there's no more room for you, Harry. So, um, got to the point probably end of 2015 and I'd been left out of the side again. And I, I rang my manager and just said, mate, can you have a look around and see if there's anything coming up? Um, I'm keen to, you know, explore all options. So luckily enough, Victoria came to the table, um, and that was a good opportunity that I couldn't really let go. And Victoria at the time had won the previous two Sheffield Shields and had been a bit of a powerhouse in state cricket. So I thought it'd be a great opportunity to go over there. There'll be pressure, obviously, going into that squad, coming in as a new bloke. Um, but I knew if I went well and played well, it'd be a great learning opportunity. And it's probably been the best thing I've ever done. Yeah, you hit the ground running. Was it uh, that 2016-17 season? Was it over 400 runs, average of 68? How much was, uh, how significant was that Shield final, that huge partnership with Travis Dean? Was it 224? Again, a stand up Yeah, I think it was it? something. Yeah, I think it was something like that. It was bloody, I remember it red hot in Alice Springs. Um, that season was really big. I was, I came to Victoria and I knew a few of the boys, but I didn't really, I, and I knew Lachlan Stevens, who was one of the assistant coaches, had been my um, head coach and assistant coach at WA. So, it was really good to have someone there like him, but um, Andrew McDonald came in as well. He'd been actually here coaching Leicester um, and he came over at the same time. So, don't know, something just happened and we just, I just got on like a house on fire with everyone and just, I was in a really good place um, and they sort of trusted me and backed me in to, you know, believe in my game and believe in what I was doing. And so, um, that season was definitely, to, well, up until then, that had been my best season ever. That first season, I'd made 800 runs or whatever, which I'd never done before. And then, like you said, I got another, me and Danny had a big partnership in the Shield final. I got another 100 in the Shield final. So um, that whole year just really set me up really well. And it was just funny how, you know, being out of home, thinking for myself, doing my own thing, just really helped my game. And um, that's helped me get to where I am now. Do you think your mindset as an opener differs from those lower down? Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think as an opener, you just got to accept that sometimes, you know, you're facing the new ball normally on the, on the, when the wicket's fresh and when the bowlers are fresh, that sometimes you're going to get knocked over and that's just part and parcel of it. You just got to accept it. But um, I think as you get older and you get more consistent, you just understand that there's a role there for you and the way you play and, you know, if you get in, you got to go big. But um, I think you just got to appreciate there's probably a bit more ups and downs as an opening batsman just because there's more variables and, you know, a person that might bat five or six. Is your mindset as an opener to still be aggressive, but aggressive in intent, so calling, running between the wickets? Again, would that, would that be fair to say as well? Yeah, I think... You know, as an opener, you sort of set the tone for the team a little bit. So if you can try and put a bit of pressure back on the other team, you know, early in a game, that's huge. I think when I was young, I probably went a little bit too far trying to put too much pressure on. I'd probably try and come out and blast them everywhere. But, um, you know, as I've got older, I've sort of give myself a bit more time. But um, I think that's come with more consistency. So, like I said, it's trying to set the tone for the team. You know, people are nervous at the start of a game. Um, especially the boys that are, if they're sitting in the change room. So if you can just, you know, hold down the other, you know, the other team's attacking options and you can just set all the, the mindset down, it uh, gets the team off to a good start and sets the tone for the game. And then 2018, that huge double century against New South Wales. 
any tips that you can give for youngsters again in terms of constructing innings, constructing a big innings? What was going through your mind in that particular innings, constructing a mammoth score? Well, I think the the catalyst to that innings was that um, that was after you know there there'd been three blokes you know suspended or whatever from the Australian Test side and. Um, there was an opportunity for batting positions in the side. And Justin Langer had said openly in the media that, you know, people that make big runs will, you know, give themselves an opportunity to get picked in the test side. So I think the main, and when I was younger, you know, if I got to a hundred in shield cricket, I'd be so happy that I'd just start teeing off and just, you know, if I got out, I didn't really care. But um, I think that's when the, when the, the switch flicked for me that I was like, well, you know, if I do something really special here, I'm half a chance to get picked for Australia. So I think it was that hunger and desire within me to want to make big runs and do well for Victoria. But also I knew that there was the carrot of, you know, playing for, for my country. So that was in the back of my mind the whole time I was batting. I remember that game. I just thought, you know, I'm not getting out here and I'm just going to make as much as I can. So I think it was just concentration. I think the main thing is you see when guys make big runs, it's people that are hungry and want to, want to make really big runs. They're not satisfied with a hundred. They want to make, you know, 150 or 200. So Obviously, it's not, not that easy to do, but it's concentration and, you know, just knowing what you need to do and understanding as ebbs and flows and in innings. If you're going to bat for 400 balls, it's not going to be all easy going. So just accepting accepting that and, you know, having a goal and understanding what you want to do. And then when you got the call to become, to, to come into the, first of the squad initially, how did that make you feel? Who gave you the call and the feelings that you were... Are you feeling? Uh, well, the emotions that you're feeling. Yeah, Trevor Hones rang me. So after I made that 250, I thought like I was probably half a chance to at least be in the squad. And then I went all right in a couple of games after that. Got a couple of good 50s on green wickets. So um, yeah, Cracker rang me at home and just said, "You're in the squad." And I can't remember what else he said, but um, it's just a flurry of emotions because that that is literally your dreams coming true, and then then it's actually a reality. So that's one of the things I've like explained to people is it's easy to dream of stuff, but when you actually have to do it, it's like, Oh shit, I'm actually going to have to, you know, go and play for Australia or whatever. But um, yeah, it was just, it was great. I was at home with my partner. So it was great to share that with her. Um, and it's just great to share with, you know, with your family and stuff like that. Cause they've been there for the whole journey. They've seen the ups and the downs and driven you all over the countryside and, you know, paid for you to go all sorts of places. So it was just great to be able to share that with, you know, friends and family. And then when you made your debut against India, who gave you the cap, the, the baggy green? And what does the baggy green mean to an Australian? Can you explain that to the viewers? Well, uh, Michael Hussey gave me my hat, fortunately. Um, I was lucky enough. I was actually having bre uh, breakfast. I was having lunch the day before with Peter Siddle. And I said to Siddle, I said, I'd be good if um, Huss could give me my hat because he gave me my WA hat. So it'd be a nice little like, combination to have. And then Sidney messaged JL. So JL, you know, teed that up with Huss. And then um, that was really good to get my hat from Huss. Um, I don't know. The baggy green is such a, um, it's such a symbol of Australia in Australia. It's such a big thing. I think um, the Australian cricket team is the whole country's team. And f football divides the country. You know, AFL's in a few states, rugby's in other states, but everyone is, you know, you know, follows the cricket side. So the baggy green is probably the most famous hat in the country. Um, and what it symbolizes is, you know, it's the whole country and you're part of, you're just lucky to be wearing the shirt and the hat, but you know, you're playing for your country and people would do anything for it. Um, so just, uh, I remember looking and seeing people with like Australian helmets and, you know, baggy greens and thinking, geez, that's pretty good. I wish I could get one of those one day. So um, it's just amazing to have it. It's no, I wouldn't, don't think it costs any more than any other hat to make, but just for what it is and what it symbolises, it's an amazing thing to have. And how did you find the initial step up to international cricket? In that first series, you got a couple of 50s as well. Did you notice the difference in levels? Yeah, it was definitely different. Um, oh, well, in my first test, oh, we fielded first, so it, was, it was sort of got into the game a little bit, you know, without having to walk out there and bat straight away. But um, I think the thing I noticed was just, facing the bowling was just how consistent they are and relentless probably from all um, prongs of the attack. There was no weak links. Um, 
And that Indian side was pretty good with, you know, Muhammad Shami, Ishant Sharma, Jasper Boomer and um, Ravi Ashwin. So that was a pretty good attack. But in the same breath, I'd batted, I think I got 26 in both innings and it was sort of one of those things when it was a bit of a light bulb moment when I was like, all righty, I'm actually good enough to, you know, spend some time at the crease and um, I feel like I can make runs. Because that's, that's the doubt that when you're going into your first test, you're like, well, am I actually going to be good enough or not? Like, am I just going to get knocked over first ball or whatever? But um, to actually spend some time in the middle, I think I probably faced 60 odd balls both innings. So um, that was really good. And then as the series went on, like I said, yeah, I got a couple of good 50s um, and I got to start every inning. So I was like, well, righty, I just got to, obviously I've got to apply myself for a bit longer to try and get big scores. But I know that I'm doing that initial bit. That generally is the hardest bit is getting through, you know, the first 20 or 30 balls. And then the Ashes 2019. What does an Ashes mean to a modern Australian cricketer? Well, the Ashes is the biggest series, obviously. And then... Um, you know, India now have become probably the second biggest series, but, you know, we always want to beat the Poms. And, um, you know, growing up as a kid, you're always in the middle of winter, you turn the TV on about six o'clock at night and watch the Ashes over in England, and it's an amazing thing to watch. So just to be a part of it was great. I know personally I didn't really go that – I didn't go anywhere near as well as what I wanted to go, but I just thought it was a great learning experience to go through early in my career was, you know, to come up a really good – come up against a really good English side. Um you know, like I said, to not go as well as what I wanted to go. But as a team, we sort of came over here and we didn't win the series, but, you know, we drew the series and played really good cricket. Um, and just to be over here and being a part of it was a great learning experience. Yeah, when you got that victory at Old Trafford, when you knew the ashes were retained, talk us through the celebrations. We saw the scenes in the dressing room, but a special moment? <clears throat> yeah, it was, especially after, you know, what, what had happened at Leeds and, sort of let it slip a little bit that we had him nine down and then Ben Stokes played that amazing innings. Um, I think it quite easily could have, you know, could have folded for us, you know, being away and being away from home and quite easily could have lost the rest of the series and gone down 3-1. But um, to be able to fight back and play, and play at Old Trafford like we did, you know, Smitty with that amazing 200 and then the boys to bowl the way they did was just, it was magical really. And then, yeah, pretty good. Um, celebrations. I know we had a good time. Um, I think they showed a bit of it in the in the documentary, but um, yeah, it was just it was a it was a great thing just to be a part of as an Australian, let alone a player. Talk us through the training in the Australian setup. See, <clears throat> you're netting and you've got the likes of Stark, Cummins, Hazelwood charging down at you. Talk us through it facing those lads. Yeah, it's not um, it's not ideal, but <laughs> you. Um, I think the thing is with the net sessions when you're in the test squad in international cricket, it sort of feels like that's as hard as it's ever going to be. So um, I always feel like if I can get through those sessions unscathed and play well, I feel like I'm ready and prepared for the middle. Um, obviously, the intensity is at a different level. If you you know if it's a big session, a couple of days out from a game, everyone's trying to you know vie for spots or you know they're going full tilt in the net. So they're hard work, but they're one of those sort of things where it's satisfying if you can get through it and bat well in those sessions that you feel like your game's in good order and it's sort of a good bit of an audit of your game by facing those boys in the nets can be a good challenge. But like I said, if you bat well, and it's just great to be a part of and being in the nets in that environment. Are you trying different things or is your mindset that you're actually treating this as if you're in a game situation? Yeah, I don't... Not so much when I'm facing the bowls in the nets. I'm not trying too much. I'm just trying to get just trying to be in the contest and, you know, get through it and play the way I can play. But, um, yeah, when the boys are bowling close to 150, then in the nets, it always feels a bit quicker. So you're not not sure there's too much you can try rather than just get in, get in behind it or get out of the way of it. So, but like I said, it's a great challenge and you actually feel better for it after you've been in there. And then your last test match came against India, that, that famous chase... Where uh, Shubman Gill ninety one, Rishabh Pant eighty nine, being out on the field, how special were there? Was that were those those two knocks in particular to beat that Australian side? Yeah, they were. You know, we I think uh, was it three eighty or something like that. We set them so um, it was pretty amazing to watch. They sort of the 
the inner thoughts the whole day where are they going to go for these runs or are they not? And then um, I think the bloke that probably played the best innings that day, well, was Richard, but um, Pajara to be able to just cop an absolute barrage from everyone and just wore them and um, sort of felt like he batted a bit like an Australian and he just took everything on the chest and got on with it and um, they just batted around him. But I think sometimes in cricket it can just be days where you just, you know, tip your cap to him to say, probably too good for us today. Um, you know, Richard Pant's innings was unbelievable. And I think everyone's seen that he's got magic in him and he's done it a couple of times now. So um, it was disappointing not to win the series. But like I said, just sometimes you got to tip your hat and just say, well done. And as we, as we said at the top, you're currently playing county cricket in the UK for Leicester. UK is known for seam and swinging conditions. How's your game adapting? Have you gone into this into this season doing slightly te- uh, things technically slightly different? Any insight you can give us as well? Uh, well, I've played here a couple of times, so just trying to. Um, I just thought when the opportunity came up to come and play county cricket, especially up when I finished the Ashes last time, I thought you know I've got to come over and play county cricket if I get the chance. So um, I jumped at the opportunity to come play here. Um, just to play on the wickets, you know, the test wickets are pretty good. So um, to get the opportunity, sometimes the first class wickets aren't always prepared the same. So I thought it'd be good to come and play on some different wickets. Um, and just, you got to play a little bit differently over in England. The wickets are a bit slow. And like I said, it moves a bit more. So you can't sort of stand and hit through the line a little bit more like you can in Australia. So um, it's probably just trying to, um, like I made a few tweaks in my game, maybe just being a bit more, side on and a bit more aligned um, like I was talking about when both guys are bowling around the wicket um, so it's been good I've felt like I've been batting pretty well in the games that I've played so far so it feels like that's working but um, yeah like it's good the conditions are tough but I, it sort of feels like if you can make runs in these conditions that your game's in good order so um, everything feels okay so far but we're only three games into a pretty long season so I'll let you know how I'm going about September yeah, so what is the short-term goals for the next 12 to 18 months for yourself? Uh, well, I think um, the next 12 to 18 months, obviously I've played the last test match. So um, I think to play a good amount of cricket in the winter, Australia, obviously summer in England, but winter in Australia, and then uh, start well at home and have myself hopefully in and around the test squad. Um, but if that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but... You know, that's my goal is to be playing for Australia and um, opening the batting and, and leading the way. I think um, the tough thing is in test crickets, you know, there's not much room for error. So you can stop and start a few times. I think in 10 test matches, I probably stopped and started three times. So it's hard to get momentum. But um, I know if I can get a good crack at it and be and play well and be consistent, I feel like I can cement my spot. So um, that's probably the goal is to, you know, get into the Australian team and then actually cement my spot and, hopefully be there for a long time but um and probably just enjoying my cricket like I have been for the last probably five years Marcus perfect thank you very much for your time today really appreciate it great talking through your career today and all the best for the for the years ahead so thank you thanks mate no worries the Neil Cagram cricket last stories Marcus Harris thank you Mm -hmm.